Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was so much better than my class. I always take two or three shots with my class. All right. So my name is Jim Mintert. I'm the director of uh, the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture and also a professor of ag economics. Um, been at Purdue about 14 years, and then prior to that, I was at Kansas State University. Um, educated at Purdue, a couple of uh, degrees from Purdue, and a PhD from the University of Missouri. And originally got my interest in agriculture by uh, helping my dad on my, our family's farm in eastern Missouri, uh, just north of St. Louis. So growing corn, soybeans, and wheat back in those days. So I'll let uh, my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, introduce himself. I'm Michael Langemeyer, <laughs> Department of Agri Agriculture Economics at Purdue. Uh, Jim and I overlapped at Kansas State. I got a PhD in, at Purdue in 1990, went to Kansas State for 22 years, and came back to Purdue to work for the Center for Commercial Agriculture. Uh, my family farms about 60 miles northwest of Omaha. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, I have a nephew coming back, and that's going to be the, the sixth generation. So we're pretty proud of that fact. So in addition to working at the Center for Commercial Agriculture, Michael's my associate director. We both teach classes at Purdue. I teach uh, commodity futures markets, and Michael teaches a couple different classes. You might mention those. Agriculture finance and, and introduction to taxes. <laughs> Exciting topics. And, and he actually means that, so <laughs> think about that. All right, so our, our topic today is talk a little bit about financial and risk management strategies for 2023. And really, our perspective is going to be a little longer than 2023 because we really think you need to think about it from a longer term perspective. We're going to start off talking to you a little bit about some of the results we get uh, on our monthly surveys that we do. And some of, you, some of you I know have heard of the Ag Economy Barometer Survey. That's a partnership project between Purdue and the CME Group in Chicago where we survey farmers across the nation every month uh, by way of telephone. And it's a sentiment survey, and it's really modeled after what the University of Michigan has done for decades with the consumer sentiment survey, and we adapted their methodology to agriculture because nobody was really talking to farmers on a regular basis to find out what they think about what's going on in their farming operation, what they think of what's taking place in the ag economy. So the slide kind of gives you some of the details. We talk to 400 people every month. It's not the same people every month. We have a large database of names that we pull from. Um, so if you get a phone call from us um, and our survey provider one month, you shouldn't hear from us for at least a year if things are working correctly. We focus on people who are engaged in agriculture as a business, and so we stratify and only try to talk to people who have an estimated gross farm income of $500,000 and up. That's not very large by today's standards, but that's large enough that it's an important part of most families' incomes. Um, and then the enterprises uh, are stratified based on the numbers that I've got there in the right-hand side of that slide. We looked at the value of farm production in the U.S. Census of Agriculture and stratified the survey that way because one of our challenges is to maintain comparability. Since we're not talking to the same people every month, how do we maintain comparability? Well, we do it by stratifying based on the enterprises. So every month, at least 53% of the people in the survey have a corn or soybean enterprise, 19% beef, 14% wheat, and so on down the line, as you see on the, on the slide there. Um, those are minimum targets. So, for example, in any given month, there's usually more than 53% of the people have a corn or soybean enterprise because somebody might be in the survey because they have a beef enterprise, but they also happen to have a corn or soybean enterprise. So those are minimum targets. Um, and it's a lot like political polling, except we have one big advantage over political pollsters. The biggest challenge they always face is who's actually going to show up and vote. We don't have to worry about that. We're talking to people engaged in agriculture, so their opinion counts. So, so we take the results from a series of questions that we ask. We start every survey with five basic questions, um, and we use those to compute the Ag Economy Barometer Index. So we ask people about what's going on in their farm today, what they think is going to happen in the future, and what they think about investments, basically. And we use those results combined of, across those five questions to compute the Ag Economy Barometer. As you look at that sentiment index, we launched this project in the fourth quarter of 2015, and then we've been collecting data every month since then. You can see that sentiment is pretty volatile. In fact, you know, more volatile than consumer sentiment. And we didn't know that when we started this, but it actually kind of makes sense if you think about what's going on in agriculture. So the Consumer Sentiment Survey covers every industry and every aspect of the U.S. economy. We're focused just on people who are engaged in production agriculture, so it's a much narrower segment, so that contributes to volatility. And then the second thing is agriculture as an industry is characterized by inelastic demand and inelastic supply, and that gives us a lot of volatility with respect to incomes and prices. So the volatility in sentiment is not too surprising. 
What is surprising to us, because we didn't know at the beginning of this, is um, the way outside factors, factors outside of agriculture, influence sentiment. And if you look at that slide for a while, you can realize some of the peaks and valleys were actually determined by uh, external events. So, for example, the 2016 election gave us our first big bump on the left-hand side of that slide. Uh, sentiment really took off following that 2016 election. People told us they were more optimistic about things like the regulatory environment facing agriculture. They were more optimistic about tax uh, environment facing agriculture. They were more uh, uh, expecting a more favorable trade environment for agriculture. So it really did change people's sentiment with respect to their, their own business. Uh, um, and we didn't really know that political events would have that kind of impact on sentiment. As you move over a little bit, you can see that 168, that peak in sentiment that took place at roughly the middle of that chart. That was just before COVID. And then, of course, sentiment collapsed uh, during COVID, uh, during the early days of COVID, much like every other sentiment survey across the U.S. economy. It didn't matter who you were talking to, consumers, businesses, we, we all became much more negative following uh, when COVID hit. But then notice there was a pretty sharp recovery in sentiment and actually peaked above that 175 mark. Um, and then since then, it's sort of drifted lower, right? So two years ago, sentiment was at 165. Um, a year ago, it was at 125. The most recent observation here that we just released a few days ago um, was at also at 125, so no change compared to last year, but still down 40 points compared to two years ago. And the thing that's surprising about that is how strong farm incomes have been these last two years, and yet sentiment is pretty weak. So people obviously feel anxious about what's going on despite the fact that we've had pretty good income levels these last couple of years. And I guess, thinking back to the beginning when we started this project, Michael, I think we really did think income would be the driver. Uh, we didn't think that we could see something like what's taken place here recently with respect to this weak sentiment and strong income. Yeah, definitely. Agriculture faces weather uncertainty. That, that's, that's no secret. We also have, uh, we have uncertainty or volatility of crop prices. What surprised us here since 21 is the volatility of input costs. And so I, I think largely what happened there is we, in, in 21, we were looking at the 21 crop, our input costs weren't that high. We had very strong crop incomes in 21 in particular uh, with fairly low, with fairly good prices with, with lower input costs, then input costs really took off. Uh, and, I, and that's when sediment really, uh, really came down those, those 40 points. Yeah, the other thing that's been quite a surprise to us, and this has taken place over a little longer time frame, is that the industry producers as a, as a group are losing confidence in growth in ag exports, which is very interesting because if you think about the long run history of U.S. agriculture, especially since World War II, one of the big engines of growth has been increasing foreign demand for what we produce, and that's really been a tremendous uh, source of growth for the industry. And yet, we've been asking this question since the beginning of 2019. Uh, over the next five years, do you think ag exports are more likely to increase, decrease, or remain about the same? And this last month, the most recent observation here in February, we got the highest percentage ever telling us they think exports are going to go down over the next five years. That's at 18% at the bottom of your screen. And the percentage that says they think ag exports are going to increase over the next five years has been declining for really the, about the last three years. If you look at that 72, that was about the end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020, 72% of the respondents said they thought exports were going to increase. Notice in the most recent survey, that's down to 33%. And I think, again, that speaks to the angst that the industry is feeling. If you're not optimistic about exports, you're, it's difficult to be very optimistic about what's taking place in the, in the industry from a longer-term perspective. Um, more recently, we started asking people, looking ahead to next year, what are your biggest concerns for your farming operation? We started asking this question last summer, and then we continue to ask it here uh, uh, really just about every month since then. So I'm going to highlight three different months. So I'm going to highlight uh, September of 22, January of 23, and February of 23. And I want you to look at the difference. So last fall, just as harvest was kind of getting underway, look at what was going on there. Number one concern for the upcoming year, higher input cost, as Michael alluded to. Uh, the number two concern was rising interest rates that particular month. If I went back to July and August, rising interest rates really wasn't quite on the horizon yet. But by September, that was starting to show up. And then probably one of the more interesting things about that is the high percentage, relatively high percentage of people who said they were worried about availability of inputs. 14% of the people in the survey said they were simply worried about getting the inputs that they needed to put a crop in the ground and to raise livestock. 
uh, only 8% were worried about lower crop and or livestock prices. And I would characterize those two as being almost upside down. I mean, if you think about the course of your career in agriculture, how many times have you really been worried about availability of inputs? We often worry about what we're paying for inputs, but we don't typically worry about the availability. And conversely, in agriculture, our number one concern most of the time is the risk of lower crop or livestock prices. And yet, look how few people were worried about that in September. You fast forward into January, and sure, high enough, sure enough, higher input cost is still number one. Rising interest rates is number two. But now we're starting to see a little bit of a change. People are worried a little, a little bit less about availability of inputs and a little bit more about lower crop and livestock prices. And again, that showed up on this most recent survey that we just did a couple of weeks ago. So availability of inputs is declining as a concern. That's good news, I think. Uh, we are seeing a return to a more traditional concern, lower crop and livestock prices, but higher input cost remains number one, and maybe a little bit of a bump with respect to concerns about what's taking place in the interest rate environment. So that kind of leads us to questions about what are we going to be able to sell crop prices? What are we going to be able to sell corn and soybeans for, Michael? So I think you took a look at that. Yeah, when, when we're looking at these break-even prices here, uh, pay particular close attention to legend. Uh, the bars are five-year averages, and, and, the, and the green line is a 10-year average uh, to take out the, the annual variations that you see in break-even prices as yields change. And what I'm clearly showing here is we reached a peak in that 2013-2014 period. Uh, then we had some, a much lower break-even prices. If, in fact, if you look at the Purdue budgets, uh, we had break-even prices for corn and high-productivity soil below $4 uh, before COVID, uh, and, and so that's reflected in the chart. And then recently, of course, with these much higher uh, break-even prices. I think, Jim, uh, corn break-evens have increased 30 percent, 30 percent in the last two years. We're seeing slowly those long-term averages go up. My point here is, is we're at a much higher break-even price. It's closer to five dollars now, and so if we did get four-dollar corn, uh, we're going to we're going to have very tight margins or very low margins. Yeah, I think the other point there, Michael, is to think about the fact. I think a lot of times we think when when costs go up, they never come back down. And I think this chart points out that we can pull production costs down. And in fact, looking at our forecast for the next several years, we think that's likely. And we're already starting to see some of that take place. The, the two costs you usually focus on when you're thinking about costs going down is cash rent. It's the first one. Uh, we did see uh, adjustments in cash rent coming out of 2014. That was the peak in Indiana. Some other states uh, uh, peaked at 2013, Iowa and Illinois, for example. Uh, we did see quite a decline in cash rents during that period. Now they've came back up. Uh, and also fertilizer. Uh, if you look at nitrogen in particular, uh, it is statistically related to corn prices and, and fuel prices. Uh, and and both, of those, uh, both of those are coming down a little bit. Uh, and so we expect those fertilizer prices to come down a little bit. So let's take a look at those costs a little more uh, over a little longer time frame. So uh, input prices have started to decline. And, and farmers are, I think, markedly so, worried about a possible cost price squeeze. So let me explain what I did in this chart. Um, we took... Prices for anhydrous ammonia, MAP, diesel, and the Indiana corn price received uh, index or prices and indexed them back to an average period. So somewhat arbitrary on my part, I used 2014 to 2016 as my average or normal period. So what that means is if you took prices for each of those inputs and averaged it on a monthly basis from 2014 to 2016, it'll, it'll average out to 100. So any index value on that chart that's above 100 is a price that is uh, indicates price was above that 2014-2016 average, and that difference in, in numbers indicates the percentage change. And conversely, if prices are below that 100, prices were a little bit below. So you look at 2014, prices were a little bit above average. Then we dropped below that average in that 2015-2016 time frame and pretty much stayed below that all the way until we got to the beginning of 21. And then, of course, you've all experienced the big run-up in input prices that we had. Anhydrous ammonia topped out at almost two and a half times that average. Uh, MAP topped out at double. Um, and fortunately, corn prices also rose, right? It's a little hard to see on that chart, but corn prices almost but not quite doubled during that time frame. On the far right, you can see that those prices have started to come down, but they are still elevated, right? They're still not anywhere close to that average that we experienced back in 2014, 2016. Our best estimate today is we're going to continue to see some moderation in those prices, uh, 
but we're really not forecasting that they're going to get back to the 2014, 2016 average, at least not anytime soon, right, Michael? Yeah, enough to lower the break-evens, but not to see the break-evens crash by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, we don't think it's going to get back to where we were. So we do think we're going to see some more moderation, but not all the way back to where we were. The other factor that we're all starting to talk more about is what's taking place with respect to with, with respect to interest rate prices. Michael, you've taken so one of the things we've done here is we've taken the Federal Reserve uh, forecast for 23, 24, and 25. So these are not our forecasts. Uh, these are using the Federal Reserve information and uh, uh, using their forecast in, in December, uh, we would expect the prime rate to be 8.1 percent. Obviously, that's a much much higher uh, than what we've seen uh, since 2000. Seven essentially, uh, we haven't been that high since 2007, and then start to taper off uh, in 24 and 25. However, I think you do have text there, Jim, uh, to suggest that, that this is changing. This is kind of a, a dynamic, a dynamic projection. We fully expect uh, these these projections to actually increase uh, given the recent strength in inflation. Uh, and so that's why we said in the text box, uh, we're, we're probably going to see something higher than 8.1 in, in, in 23, uh, maybe eight and a half or, or even even higher than that. Yeah, if you listen to Fed uh, Chairman Powell last week when his testimony in front of Congress, which isn't exactly a projection, but he gave some pretty strong hints that the next uh, Fed rate rise could be a half point which would cause those forecasts to blow through what we've got on the chart. Just for a little clarity, the Fed doesn't actually forecast prime rates. What they do is forecast the federal funds rate. And then if you look at the relationship between prime and the federal funds rate, it averages about 3 to 3.2 percent above uh, the federal funds rate. So that's how we came up with these numbers. And then numbers. if you look at the interest rates from the Federal Reserve System, like Federal Reserve Bank of, of Chicago or Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, half, add a half to 1 percent. Uh, to these these prime interest rates, the prime interest rate is is what the best customers get uh, across business across the business business landscape in the United States. Yeah, I think a lot of you can look at those prime rates and translate what that means to you in terms of an operating load based on uh, what your particular relationship is with your banking uh, customer or firm. So we asked producers this last month what they think is going to happen to a prime rate. So 44% of the farmers said that they expect to see the prime rate reach the 8.75 to 9.75 range by early 2024. That's one way to look at that slide. Uh, the other way to look at that is we've got uh, roughly one out of four producers who think we're either going to see no change in interest rates or actually see interest rates come down. And um, I guess, Michael, you know, in terms of our own personal bias, we lean towards the far right-hand side of that chart because we think it's going to be tougher to pull down inflation than some people think. We think the stronger or higher interest rates are going to last a bit longer than some people in the financial markets have been suggesting. Yeah, first of all, there's always a lot of diversity uh, in opinion in these questions. We're going to show that on two or three slides here. This is this is one of them. So we always see that in questions like this. But I, I think that 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 lower that quartile there is thinking that inflation was going to be uh, was going to be licked. Uh, this year, uh, we were, uh, inflation was going to come down, and then the Fed would start adjusting those interest rates, and that just does not look like, like it's going to happen. Yeah, we, th we think inflation is going to be with us for a while, and the Fed's going to have to fight this longer than some people think, and that leans us towards some higher interest rates. And so thinking about that from a planning standpoint, incorporate that into your, your planning. We ask people about their expectations for farmland values every month. We ask a couple of different ways. We ask a short-term uh, outlook, and then we ask a little longer-term outlook. The short-term outlook is, what do you think is going to happen in your home area in the next 12 months? The longer term outlook is about what do you think is going to happen over the course of the next five years, and we can uh, convert that into an index as well. So this is the short term farmland value expectation index. And the numbers I've highlighted I just take you back year by year. So the 119 is the most recent observation. The 145 is a year ago. The other 145 is two years ago, 103, three years ago, and so on. So if you look at an index value above 100, that means people in the aggregate have a positive sentiment, meaning that they expect to see some increase take place in, in, with respect to farmland values in the upcoming year. But notice over the last year how we have lost some confidence in the fact that they think farmland values are going to go up. A year ago, that index was 145, 119 this last month. That's still a positive index value. But sentiment is becoming noticeably weaker than it was, for example, last year and really two years ago as well. And you can see that maybe a little more clearly when you look at the raw, <coughs> excuse me, the raw responses to that question. <coughs> excuse me. 
So this is the raw responses, and it tells you the percentage of people who said they expect to see higher farmland prices. Those are the green bars. And the red line is expectation people, percentage of people who expect to see lower farmland values. So a year ago, 51% of the people in the survey expected to see higher farmland values in the upcoming 12 months. This most recent month here in February, that's down to 33%. And a year ago, 6%, only 6%, said they expected to see lower farmland values in the upcoming year. This month, it was 14%. That shift isn't enough to cause the index to go negative, uh, to drop below 100. But it does indicate that people are becoming a little bit nervous about what's taking place and whether or not we could see any further growth in farmland values. Um, and then, Michael, we followed up and asked people about what they think is the driver with respect to uh, growth in farmland values. In this case, it's about what people who think that farmland values are going to rise over the next five years. And that's been very interesting. The first time we asked this, I, I was quite frankly shocked. It doesn't take a lot to shock me, but this, this definitely shocked me because I was, tr I was truly under the belief that the fundamentals, uh, net return to land, cash rent, and interest rates would, would drive this question. It did not. Uh, in fact, for a long time now, alternative investments is, is, is ranked very high, uh, are, are very, has, has a huge response, uh, and is, is, is ranked as the number one factor uh, impacting land values uh, from the respondents' uh, surveys, answers to the questions. And that's probably tangled up a little bit with inflation, right? Because if you think about non-farm investors, one reason non-farm investors <clears throat> excuse me, might be interested in investing in farmland is because they're worried about inflation. Inflation, uh, farmland historically has been a pretty good inflation hedge. So there's a couple of things tangled up there. But yeah, we were both surprised. Uh, and it's been very consistent. I'm only showing one month's responses here. But if you look at the responses we've gotten month by month, it's been very consistent. And, and a couple other things, Jim. I, I do think the, the alternative investment crowd does look at the fundamentals. And so when you when you when you you talk to people that that run auctions, uh, if the fundamentals do not look do not look like they're going to pay for this ground, the ground you know the the they, they think it's going to go the value is going to go above the fundamentals, they usually drop out of the bidding. And so these these factors are interrelated. Uh, another thing, just to prevent this question from happening later, uh, we do not have this information broken out by region. We simply do not have enough observations because it's a national survey uh, to do that. Yeah, it's a question we get a lot. Um, and when we, when we visit with the auctioneers, for example, some of the bigger uh, farmland auctioneers in the nation who occasionally do work with some of the big pension funds, et cetera, they always tell us the same thing, which is that those funds come in with targeted investment returns, and they're only interested in making a purchase if they can hit their targeted return level. And recently, that's been almost impossible, right? Yes. So for most of them. So, um, so one of the other things that's really interesting, and this has been some work that we've just been working on here uh, lately, is there's some pretty wide variations in farm operations plans for growth. And actually every year, uh, I think starting the first year of the survey, so in February of 16 and then every February since then, we asked people, what is a reasonable annual growth rate expectation you have for your farm for the next five years? And the response is this, again, I don't know if this shocked us, but it was a surprising result, at least the first time, but it's been pretty consistent. We haven't seen too much variation in this. So no plans to grow, roughly one-third of the people in the survey, uh, reduced the size of their operation, 16%. So that's almost half the survey. That's a 49%. Uh, a annual growth rate of less than 5%, so 0 to 5 or up to 5, 19%. People expecting to grow 5 to 10% per year, 22% of the survey. And then we've got a few people on the extremely rapid growth curve, uh, 10 to 15 percent or greater than 15 percent. And I, I wonder sometimes, Michael, some of those rapid growth people, if they've really thought about what compound growth means, because that would be astronomical rates of growth. So some people might not be thinking about it from a long-term perspective. Yeah, for example, 10, 10 percent growth would imply doubling every seven years. Yeah. So they're... They might not be thinking quite that far into the future, but it's very interesting to think about this relatively large percentage of people who have effectively no plans to grow or maybe really just plan to exit the industry. That's that, two ways of looking at that. Uh, one way, I, I guess I like to think from a more optimistic perspective, if you're a young person in this room, it suggests there's some opportunities for growth because if those people are leaving, Somebody's going to continue to farm that land. So there are some opportunities out there. And when people say there's no opportunities, there are clearly some opportunities if those people are going to be exiting the industry in the relatively near future. 
and one of your challenges is to get to know those folks and find out what their plans are and how you might help them. And hopefully those folks are in your area. That's always a challenge too. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you've been looking at lately, Michael, is differences in sentiment among survey respondents and then thinking about the implications of that for growth. Yes. Uh, one, one of the things that we did recently with our advisory board, they came in uh, recently and we said, we're, we're going to have the advisory board uh, go ahead and, and fill out the, the Ag Economy Barometer survey. And when we did that, they were very optimistic. And so then Jim and I started talking and said, well, that's probably true of our, of our monthly survey. And so let's take a look at that. Let's say, take a look at the relative opti uh, you know, uh, level of optimism and pessimism uh, with these 400 producers that we surveyed in February. So the first group we're going to look at is people who have an index value of less than 100. So those are people that don't, don't have a very positive sentiment, right? So just to back up a little bit, if you think about the ag economy barometer, the index value of 100 is based on a base period. And the base period in our survey is the fourth quarter of 2015 and the first quarter of 2016. So an index value of less than 100 says you are less optimistic during, than during that base period of 2015 to 2016. An index value above 100 says you're more optimistic. So let's look at the folks, uh, the percentage of folks who have an index value of less than 100. Um, so 60? 60. 60. Uh, these aren't, uh, back up, these aren't percentages. These are numbers, right? These are the index value. Yeah. 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 All right. And then, then the second one, 180, 180. So look at the difference there uh, in, in the in the optimi relative optimism and pessimism of the people we're surveying. This is related to farm growth, and we're going to show that. Uh, you would think that the people that are growing are more optimistic of where agriculture is heading. Uh, and let's, let's also uh, mention here that uh, the, the ag economy barometer is broken into two sub-indices. One of them focuses on current conditions. That's the latest year or looking ahead one year. And the other questions focus on five years from now. Uh, and so in one of the farm growth, you know, we're going we're gonna to bust this part a little bit uh, for the farm growth categories. But, uh, but there is a difference even there. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes people are more optimistic from a, in the future perspective than they are current and vice versa. So just to remind you, so we said the overall index on our survey was 125. The folks that are have an index value of less than 100 are pretty negative, right? They're coming in at an index value of 60. That's pretty doggone negative. And conversely, the people who have an index value above 100 came in at an average of 184. So they are pretty optimistic. So we've really got some big dispersion there with, with respect to uh, optimism in terms of their farmer sentiment. So then you've taken a look at this with respect to growth, right? Explain yes. how you did this. We have three different categories. The first category, the first column there, is people that expect to uh, reduce their, their farm size. The second category is no growth. And then the third category, I bunched all those people that were expecting to grow 0 to 5%, 5 to 10%, over 10% uh, into that third category. So let's look at the indices, the index of current conditions, the index of future expectations, and that overall index, the Ag Economy Barometer Index, for the people who have no plans to grow, actually plan to shrink or exit, right? So the, for the first group, the people that expect to reduce their farm size, they're relatively pessimistic. And so part of the reason why they're probably going to reduce their farm size or, or not change their farm size uh, may have nothing to do with somebody coming back. They're relatively pessimistic about where, where agriculture is currently at and where it may be heading, at least less optimistic than the other groups. And then the people that are kind of a steady state, no plans to grow, but no plans to shrink either. This one's really interesting, Jim, because they're fairly optimistic when it comes to the index of future expectations. And so when you look out five years, they're not pessimistic necessarily, but they're relatively pessimistic about the current conditions. Uh, and, and so that brings their Ag Economy Barometer Index below the average. And so we spent some time thinking about, well, what, what does that mean? If you're optimistic about the future in a relative sense, but there's something holding you back in your current situation, and you know, you think about why why do people want to grow? But for a lot of people, maybe the number one reason for growing might be that they want to bring back another family member, right? Uh, yeah. Or or they would like to grow, but they're simply not able to. Maybe they don't have enough retained earnings that allows them to funnel that uh, retained earnings into growth, right? Yes. So those are those are a couple of concerns that might be holding back that middle group. They perhaps would like to expand but maybe something in the current situation is holding them back. And then the folks that and then are... The, and then the folks that, that, are, that, are, that are planning on growing, they're more optimistic, particularly with respect to the index uh, index of current conditions, but also the Ag Economy Barometer Index. And so large differences in, in, in relative optimism there, depending on whether farms expect to grow or not. 
And again, I think that contrast and that index of current conditions between that steady state group versus the folks that are planning to grow is very interesting because it, there, the implication is we don't actually, we can't confirm this in the data, but the implication is that they've got enough retained earnings that they can actually do something, right? They've got enough, the financial wherewithal to actually move ahead and perhaps bring back that family member, uh, funnel that, those retained earnings into, into growth opportunities. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a more opportunistic group. Another way to think about that, if you're bringing family members in, don't you have to be somewhat optimistic or you'd talk them out of doing that? And, and so I, I think there's also, it's, it's also important to, to realize here. So this brings up a good topic for us, and that is from the long run perspective, growing your farm business is not really optional. If you really plan to stay in business, you're going to have to grow over time. And let's think about some of the key reasons why that's really true. So the first one is to adopt new technology. And of course, this convention highlights new technology. But it is certainly true that a lot of the new technology is not scale neutral. If you really want to take advantage of the new technology over time, you're going to have to get bigger. That historically has been true, and I don't see that changing. That's not true of every single technology. But when you think about the aggregate, clearly there are incentives to become bigger, to fully capitalize and fully take advantage of that new technology. That doesn't mean that all farms can't use a particular piece of technology, but one of the reasons why we think this is typically typically the larger operations have more retained earnings, uh, more working capital that they can invest uh, in new machinery. And so that's one of the reasons why we see that, uh, that larger operations tend to adopt the new technology faster. The second one is to improve asset utilization, right? One of the challenges we face in agriculture is a lot of the assets that we acquire are lumpy, right? If you add another combine or you buy a bigger planter, you can't buy it in small increments, right? You have to buy the entire thing, the entire unit, and you've got to find a way to utilize that asset. So if you want to take advantage of the new technology, buy that new combine with a big 50-foot head on it, you're going to have to find the acres to run that on, right? And if you look at per unit, per unit <laughs> cost differences for different cost categories, the two that really stand out, uh, if, you look, if you look at benchmarking data, are labor and machinery costs. And so this is related to, related to economies of size. Uh, larger farms tend to have lower per unit labor costs and lower per unit machinery costs. That doesn't mean that, that they're always lower, but there is, the, there is a tendency for that to be the case. So the third reason is to bring in new family members. We've already kind of mentioned that, but it's pretty clear. You know, one of the challenges, and think about this from a lot of farming operations, maybe you're in kind of this steady state mode, and maybe that's been just fine, right, in terms of providing a, your family's income, but you want to bring that new family member in and yet the older generation isn't ready to retire. That's pretty tough to do. And some of you have probably already faced that situation. So if you want to bring in new family members, you've got to be thinking about growth, and you've got to be thinking about it ahead of time, right? Because you can't just do it all at once. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the case. And one of the topics we talk a lot about is succession planning. Uh, and, and we talk about this topic, how farm does it need to, the farm need to be? Well, that depends on, on the, real, of the ages of the older generation and the younger generation. If the older generation wants to farm 10, 15, 20 more years, that's a much different situation than if they're close to retirement. Um, the last one, the fourth one, is invest retained earnings. And so if you think about it, uh, one of the challenges we face, and we're going to talk more about this a little later, but one of the challenges we face is how do you grow over time? Um, we're, we're going to do some comparisons with stock market returns here a little later. And it's relatively easy to invest retained earnings in the stock market. It's a little more difficult in agriculture, but particularly as operation sizes increase, that becomes a little more feasible on an ongoing basis so that you can invest returnings year after year as opposed to just doing these, these lumpier uh, incremental changes. And a, lot of, and a lot of farms do invest their retained earnings. Let's, first of all, let's back up and define retained earnings. We're looking at net farm income minus the owner withdrawal. So how much money is left in the business? And, and again, larger operations tend to have more money left in the business after they subtract owner withdrawals for family living expenses. And so what do they do with that? A lot of times they put that back in the business that allows them to grow faster. And the last one uh, might be one that you wasn't on uh, top, top of your mind thinking about wh why you want to expand, but more fully utilize the skills of key managers. And I really was thinking about two things there. We, we kind of talked about this the other day. So one of the challenges you have is if you bring out an employee and that employee has a fairly stagnant uh, set of responsibilities, what happens? They're, they're looking for growth, 
In fact, if you interview, we're both college professors, and so we visit a lot with the students, and, and they, we visit with them after they've had a chance to visit with companies. And one of the things students always talk to us about is, where would I be if I went with that company five years from now? What are the growth opportunities for me from a career standpoint with that firm? So if you want to think about bringing an employee into your business, one of the things they're probably thinking about is, what would I be doing, not in year one, but what would I be doing three years from now, five years from now, and perhaps even 10 years from now? So that's one thing. And then the other one maybe is with respect to a family member, right? Yeah, I was going to say, it's not just employees, it's also family members. One of the things that's very frustrating to the younger generation, if you don't start giving them some management responsibility fairly early, uh, and there's ways to do that. Uh, maybe they have a, a better finance background than you do. Let them take over some of the books and, and some of the financial analysis. Maybe it's marketing. Jim teaches a, a marketing class. Maybe they've taken Jim's class and a couple other marketing classes, uh, and they would like to, to have a more active role in that. Go ahead and, and, and have them do that because uh, that, gets their, that gets their entrepreneurial spirit uh, you know, and juices flowing uh, and, and excited about working on, working on the farm. So if we're going to think about farm growth, we probably need to think a little bit about farmland, right? And I think that's probably a topic on everybody's mind with respect to what's taken place for farmland values, especially in the Corn Belt here recently. So let's think a little bit of what are the key factors influencing farmland values. Uh, the first one is net return to land. And we'll talk a little bit about long-run corn prices. Well, but let me pause there, Jim. Okay. Really, when you, when you, you know, some people ask, ask me at meetings, how can someone justify paying that much for a piece of ground? Part of this goes back to, to, to their expectations. Are they thinking corn prices are going to be $5, $5.50, $6, $6.50? That makes a lot of difference in, in their attitude uh, in terms of bidding on, on, a, on a piece of ground. And so that's what we're talking about there. It's not just what have your returns been recently, what do you expect them to be uh, five, ten years from now? Yeah, and it's actually probably a combination yes. of those two. But, um, so the second one, and this is really relevant to, given what's taking place right now with respect to interest rate, is what is the capitalization rate? And we'll talk more about a, a, an example here in a minute. But if you look at the wrong, long run average cap rate for farmland, it's been closer to 5%. But if you look at recent history, it's been way below that. And that's what we were referring to earlier with respect to outside investors, uh, particularly things like pension funds not being happy with the uh, cap rates that they're able to get in the farmland market. Um, and then the third one is probably inflation. You've looked at that. Yeah, farmland's a very good hedge against inflation. In fact, I had a research student look at this a, a few years ago. Uh, it's a better hedge against inflation than gold and silver. Uh, and, and, and the investment community knows this. And so that's not just a, another reason why they're interested in farmland. And then finally, alternative investments. And really, from my perspective, three and four, inflation and alternative investments kind of come together to some yeah. extent. And when we talk about alternative investments, we're talking about, yes, we're talking about institutional investors, pension companies. We're also talking about people outside of agriculture. Maybe they had roots in agriculture one or two generations ago that have some money. And they're deciding, what should I do with this money, stock market, farmland, or both? Uh, and so we see that a lot of times, a lot of times that it is some of the, some of these purchases are made by people outside of agriculture that have been successful in another business and just looking for something to diversify, uh, diversify their investments. Again, when we visit with uh, several of the largest uh, farmland auction marketers uh, in the nation, auctioneers, uh, and they look at their clientele list, who's actually been purchasing farms, um, they always tell us that a little bit, they, they were maybe a little better informed than we were with respect to expecting some non-farm investor support for farmland values. But they always tell us that the vast majority of non-farm investors that participate in their auctions are local people, right? People that live in that county, uh, or in some cases maybe grew up in that county and have moved away, but they're looking to invest in farmland. Uh, it might be because they want to diversify their portfolio. They've already got a stock market portfolio and they want to diversify. Um, it might be because they don't like to invest in the stock market at all and they like to have everything in real assets, but it tends to be pretty local people uh, as opposed to outside investors from New York, et cetera. So that's kind of a misconception. There's something about being able to drive by your farmland or look at your gold and silver coins that you just don't have with the stock market. So yeah. So that, I'm kind of like that myself. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at long run corn prices. These are monthly Indiana corn prices going back to 2007. We picked 2007 for a reason because that's kind of the start of the ethanol era. Uh, and, and that kind of maybe changed things from a regime standpoint. So here's the monthly averages going back to 2007 up to uh, January of this year. A lot of fluctuations in there. 
But the relevant part is probably what that longer term average. Michael, what is that longer term? The long run average there is 470. Uh, and so the open question here is: Are we going to have mean reversion? Are we going to go back to that that uh, go back to that 470? Are we going to go back to five dollars long term? Where do we think those corn prices are going to be? And the audience is and waiting. And I ask that as open question so Jim can answer the, the, it. The audience is waiting for the answer to that question. It turns out we don't know the answer to that question. That's why it's got a question mark on the slide. But that is that is what people are looking at, right? So some people do think we're going to see a mean reversion. Those are probably some of the folks that are very pessimistic on our survey. Other people think we've seen a, a new regime change here. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit later. Um, let's do a little comparison between farmland and the S&P 500. And yeah, we've, we've already talked about this a little bit, and so uh, what we're, what we're going to show you here is the price-earnings ratio uh, for the S&P 500, and then a uh, price to rent, so a land price divided by cash rent, and we're going to we're going to contrast those. And so go ahead and bring that that slide up, Jim. Uh, and, and what you see here is uh, the S&P 500 is very volatile. Uh, anybody that has money in, in a 401k knows that uh, it has it has a lot of ups and downs. And so let's contrast that uh, with farmland. So I, before you go ahead here, I have, we had a conversation about this a few days ago, and I have to say, I was a little surprised because I hadn't looked at this exact chart for a while, and the peak on that chart surprised me a little bit. In fact, we debated whether or not we had the numbers right, so we did a little double check. I double checked. It's a, it's a dot-com bubble. Yeah, so it, it is possible to get some pretty astronomical uh, S&P uh, price-earning ratios, a little more than you might think uh, from, from a longer-term standpoint. You compare this to the farmland, and it looks different. Yes, the farmland, if you look at the farmland by itself, it says, my, this is quite volatile. It's not compared to the stock market. So yet another reason why uh, people that invest in the stock market also are interested in the farmland. Uh, they're not related. They're not closely related. And so that's good from a diversification standpoint. So hindsight's 2020, but if we had uh, some really good uh, foresight back in the mid-1980s, uh, that farmland price-rent ratio looked pretty attractive, right? If you think about it from that standpoint, in the mid-80s, uh, we bottomed out uh, at a... At a uh, we didn't have ethanol in the late 1980s, so corn price was much lower. So Yeah, <laughs> so the other thing that's gone on here, though, uh, that also factors into that blue line, is farmland has benefited, as have all real assets, from the long-term decline in interest rates that's taken place over the last 40 years. And you're kind of seeing that bid into that uh, price-rent ratio for farmland, right? Definitely. I, I, one, one other way to saying that, if you look from 2007 to 2014, uh, what I call the ethanol boom, land prices went up much faster than cash rent, uh, regardless of the state you look at uh, across the Corn Belt. Why? Well, land was responding to the high cash rent net return to land, but also low interest rates. So... Before I show this next slide, I want you to explain it because it, it's probably one that we're not used to seeing. I will try to explain okay. it. Rather than looking at the annual earnings, we decided to smooth that out. Uh, there's an economist named Schiller uh, that, re that really suggests it's better to look at this more from a long-term perspective, these ratios, than just looking at one year at a time. And so that's what we're trying to do in this next slide. We have uh, S&P 500 price divided by the 10-year average earnings uh, for, for, the, for the, uh, the stocks in the S&P 500. The same with agriculture. We're taking le current land price uh, divided by the average of the last 10 years of net return to land or cash rent. So stated another way, what it's really trying to do is smooth out those income fluctuations that you see on a year-to-year -year basis, right? And so arguing that people look at a longer-term history when they make a big purchase like farmland or a stock, mm -hmm. right? So here's, whoops, here's the chart. And so uh, let's don't belabor this chart too much because we want to we want to talk a little bit about uh, some future supply and demand factors. But but notice there, uh, you, you when you got right up 2000, 2013 to 2014, we had a very high uh, price rent ratio. Then as as uh, as earnings came down, uh, 2014 to 2019, we saw a decline in that ratio. Recently, we've seen an increase. Where are we thinking we're head we're heading in the future? Uh, my my uh, I'm going to. Talk about direction, not not how much it's going to go down, but I think that that's going to go. That price uh, to rent ratio is going to go down. Why? I think the cat there's there's upward pressure on the capitalization rate. Yeah, when we'll show that here a bit. So here, let's take a look at that. So let's look at the present value of farmland at various capitalization rates. So what we did here is take a inflation adjusted uh, cash rent of two hundred sixty two dollars per year in year one. And then we assumed that that cash rent 
over time would increase at the rate that cash rents have tended to increase over long periods of time, which is about uh, 45, not well, just a little under half. And that's a real year. increase. That's adjusted for inflation. Yeah. So there is a little bit of an upward slope in that cash rental rate. So at a cap rate of 1.5%, you wind up with a farmland value of over $25,000 an acre. That same income stream at a 2% cap rate drops pretty hard. Two and a half, three, three and a half. So you can kind of see those cap rates matter tremendously. And five is off the off the chart here. Five percent is a long run average. I don't think, and I don't think anybody, Jim, thinks we're heading back to a, a capitalization rate of five percent, at least anytime soon. But we certainly could see a half percent increase, a half to one percent increase, and, and that had, that would be very detrimental to farmland values. So I think it's important to, to think about this for just a second, though. So there is a, based on that analysis, there is a risk that we've seen, uh, if we're not at the top of farmland values in the short run, that we're perhaps very close. Um, our surveys would suggest there is still some optimism out there, but there's less optimism now than there was a year ago about farmland values. But if you buy a farm and you're doing it for growth, you're not doing it based on the one or two or three year outlook for farmland values, are you? No. Uh, I, I, I think you need to take a lo longer look at net return to land, but also a longer look at this capitalization rate. Not only where, where's the current interest rate, but where, where do we think the interest rate might be heading uh, in the next five to 10 years? And, and so uh, what, uh, if you look at the Purdue, uh, the Purdue mm -hmm. land value survey, it would be similar to other surveys across the Corn Belt, of course. Uh, some of those capitalization rates in some of those regions are 2.2%. So even below the 2.5%. And, and, and the only point we're making here, it's probably not going to stay there. Uh, it's going it's to head, it's gonna head north. Uh, it's just a question of how much. Uh, and, and, and this by itself would, would, would tend to make land values decline. But remember, there's a lot of other factors impacting land values, including cash rent, net return to land. That's still fairly bright. Uh, if, if you look at that, inflation is also an important factor. Uh, these outside investors is also an important factor. And, and so essentially what's happening here uh, is that negative factor is keeping those positive factors in check. All right. So when considering management strategies for your farm, remember the following. And you might you, this, this might be the most important part of the presentation, so you might want to write this down. No one actually knows what's going to happen. <laughs> And meetings like this are full of sessions where people trying to tell you they think they know what's going to happen. We're all, it's human nature to search for some expert that knows what's going to happen. The reality is we don't know what's going to happen. Good managers embrace uncertainty and develop strategies to increase the odds of success. Nothing certain out there, right? So, but you're trying to raise or improve the odds of success for your family and your farming operation. So let's think about some long-run farm management strategies because that's how we sold this, uh, uh, this session. We said we were going to provide some strategies. So let's talk about some strategies here. So the first one is decide what your competitive advantage is. Are you a low-cost producer? Is that really your strength? Maybe you're a value-added kind of a perspective. Okay. Our observation is that mixing those two can be a challenge, and that's where sometimes people get into trouble. It, it very, very much so because they'll think, well, I'm going I'm to pursue both. I'm both, both going to uh, sell my product for a higher price uh, and also be a low-cost producer. What happens to some of those people? Uh, they, they, they follow the value-added strategy and their costs creep up uh, to get that additional price. And so it's usually one or the other. Uh, which one of those are you going to be interested in? And, and traditionally, agriculture or farms have been very interested in that low-cost strategy. I'm not saying that's not still important, but with the advent of precision agriculture, we can really track attributes uh, uh, attributes of a crop so much better than we used to that I think that's going to lead to more people uh, uh, looking at that value-added strategy. You know, producing something that's just a little different, non-GMO corn is an example uh, in, in our uh, language here, uh, uh, seed soybeans, things like that. It's more opportunities to create value add than perhaps in the past is what way I would kind of think of that, Michael. So the second point is to identify strategies that increase your odds of success. So some of these are pretty traditional, but I'm always surprised at how few people actually or how many people actually don't look at this, right? So take advantage of things like seasonal trends and prices and basis. 
that might not work in every single year, but you think about it from a longer term perspective, five, 10, 15 years in your career, that is gonna help over longer periods of time. Growing value added crops has become a bigger and bigger thing as Michael just mentioned. Um, doing some simple things, like one of the things that's really jumped out at us, one of the things we do at Purdue is we do a farm management tour every summer. And one of the things that's really jumped out at us in recent years is how many people have really figured out the value of improved drainage. Or stated another way, maybe a little more broadly, improved water management, because it's not just about drainage. It depends on where you're at, right? It might be improved irrigation strategy about providing water as opposed to getting rid of excess water. But those are strategies that over long periods of time pay off. Um, and then the last one, which I kind of highlighted, is develop a long-run reinvestment plan for growth. And I highlighted it because when we visit with farms, even though we ask that question or a related question on our surveys every year, how many farms really have a long run plan for growth? Not everybody, certainly not everybody. And in fact, when we visit with people, a lot of times people will tell you that the growth just sort of ha happened accidentally. Well, maybe that's true, but what we're arguing is you really ought to think about the growth strategy and really think about how you're going to fund that growth strategy over long periods of time. It needs to be more of a conscious decision, right? And it's, it includes all fixed assets. It's machinery, equipment, grain bins, you know, shops, uh, farmland. And it would include all, all fixed assets. Another exercise that I, I conduct with young producers and, 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 and individuals in my class, which are, which are young individuals too, uh, is, is I ask them, what do you do better than everybody else? It's kind of a corny question, but it's extremely important in this context. What, what are some skills that you have that nobody else has? How can I take advantage of those skills? Am I one of those people that evaluate a strategy would not work because you have a personality like Michael here uh, that's more of an introvert? Or am I one of those people that they would be very successful because I have an easy time uh, as a salesman. I'm a good salesman. Uh, my grandfather was a tremendous salesman, sold feed and seed uh, you know, for decades and was extremely successful at that. Uh, he, he would have been very good at evaluating strategy uh, because he could, he could sell. Uh, he could sell that commodity. And then the last point is use scenarios to help uh, you respond quickly to changing conditions. And this is something, again, that not a lot of producers do. Um, it's a business management strategy. It's widely taught in business schools. A lot of bigger firms practice this. It's not as commonly used in agriculture, but it's very useful. And that is to think about what strategy you would pursue in a favorable environment, the most likely environment, the one you think is going to happen, the odds are highest of, and then what, what would we do in a worst case scenario, right? What would we do if things really kind of turn negative? And then identify strategies, management strategies you would pursue in each of those situations. We had a situation a few years ago. We taught a financial management course with a group of about 16 uh, commercial scale farms from the Midwest. And we actually practiced this with them. And we had them do strategies. And the first strategy session we had, I think, was in March, middle of March. And then we met with them again in the middle of June. And the world had changed in that three-month span. In the middle of March, things looked pretty dire. Some of those farms had some pretty negative uh, projections as the most likely scenario. By the time June rolled around, they were able to lock in their best case scenario for many of those farming operations. You had to be ready for it. You had to be thinking about that ahead of time and realize, oh, we just hit the trigger. This is about as good as we thought it could possibly get back in March why don't we go ahead and make some sales and lock in these positive returns, right? The other way, and I, I talk about this a lot at the extension meetings that I, I do throughout Indiana and the surrounding states, is do three budgets. I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm geeking out here a little bit, but bear with me. Do three budgets. One for $5 corn, one for five fifty corn, and one for like six twenty five, six fifty corn. All of those are possible. Uh, the five fifty is the most likely, but it's, it's possible uh, that we could have $5 corn. It's possible that we could have corn similar to today's prices. What would you do differently under those three price scenarios? And so that's an easy way to think about this scenario analysis. Uh, and another way to think about it, uh, sometimes you see this in the business press. You kind of look at it from a quadrant perspective, and you think about, well, one quadrant, which is that number one on the upper left corner, that's your best case scenario, strong demand, um, a relatively weak supply response situation. Uh, the worst case scenario is at number three in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. So you can kind of think about it from a, what, how would that play out for me, right? And so that would be maybe four scenarios to look at instead of three. But still, think about 
it's just a way of kind of characterizing, you know, why would we be in this situation with respect to demand and supply for the in products? In a force scenario, uh, that that does happen occasionally. We saw that in, in the mid 1980s, but we also saw that to some extent in that 2014 to 2019 period for for corn and soybean producers uh, in, in the Corn Belt. And so, one of the questions you really need to to, to ask yourself in a scenario like that is. is how would I make sure that I preserve working capital so that I can make sure that I can cover my loan payments uh, in the fall? And so it's as simple as that. Uh, in a scenario, in, in, if that scenario happens again, uh, coming down the pike, uh, what would I need to do differently today to make sure I have enough working capital? Whereas in, in, in number one, you've got the opposite issue. I'm going to have enough working capital. What should I do with it? You know, how, how aggressive should I be bidding uh, bidding for cash rent? How aggressive should I be buying farmland? How aggressive should I be uh, buying machinery? All right. So this last part is maybe as close as we're going to get to some forecasting here. So let's let's talk about that. Let's look ahead at some of the upside and downside risks. So on the upside, why would you be optimistic? Well, long run population growth. You've all heard that. That's not a new story. Relatively tight world supplies. If you look at the world supply demand sheets, if you look at um, to uh, carryover estimates coming for the major exporters for corn and soybeans. They're relatively tight. Um, the last one's kind of an interesting one, growth in demand for renewable fuels. We've been through the ethanol growth period. That's topped out, right? But what about growth for bio-based fuels coming out of soybeans? Um, so renewable diesel is clearly on the horizon. I mean, it's been growing already, but it's likely to grow even more going forward. The wild card here is sustainable aviation fuel. And at this point, it's unclear how that's going to shake out. But you could paint a scenario where that creates an extremely bullish environment for soybean oil, and that spills back over into soybeans. Um, just to look at what's going on right now, um, this is a chart from the Energy Information Agency. There is existing capacity for renewable diesel in the dark blue. There's the announced additional planned capacity. Now. Looking at this room, a lot of you remember the boom in ethanol. One of the things that happened in the ethanol era was a lot of plants got announced that never actually got built, right? So I wouldn't guarantee that all these plants are going to get built. In fact, I'd say the opposite. They probably won't all get built. But we are going to see significant increases in capacity, and it is going to have an impact. So if you want to think about being positive, uh, renewable fuels could clearly be a, a factor going forward, and perhaps a little bit like what ethanol was uh, back 15 years ago. Um, if you think about key growing regions around the world, we've got limited expansion capacity, and obviously the uncertainty with respect to what's going on in the Black Sea region continues to hang over uh, agriculture from a worldwide perspective. Oh, what about the negative side? Well, on the downside, increasing South American acreage in production. Historically, we've worried about increases in soybean acreage in, in South America. Now we're worried more about uh, increases in corn acreage in production down there. Uh, we could see a pretty big rebound from weak yields in both North and South America. That's especially a concern here this year versus uh, last year, which would increase exportable supplies. Lots of concerns about a world recession, and that impacts consumer incomes, which impacts import demand, which is a factor uh, would be negative for us. Strength in the U.S. dollar as the Fed continues to increase that uh, federal funds rate. That puts pressure on the dollar, upward pressure on the dollar, which hurts our exports from making them more expensive on a worldwide basis. Um, and then, obviously, rising interest rates, increasing production cost, and, and potentially negatively impacting land values we just outlined. So let's go back to the ag economy barometer, Jim, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. I didn't tell you I was going to do this. Um, when we look at the upsides and downsides, my personal opinion is right now the upsides are stronger than the demand side, and so particularly long term, I'm relatively bullish on production agriculture. I'd like to uh, see your, have your perspective on that. Well, he made that easy because he put long term in there. So it's easy <laughs> from a long term perspective. It's pretty easy. I, I agree. So from a long term perspective, very optimistic. The challenge, I think, is the short run, right? So with rising interest rates and the potential short run negative impact on land values, that could create some stress for some folks. So as you think about your scenarios, I think you have to look at your own farming operation and say, what happens if these interest rates continue to go up? That has a negative impact on land values. What does that do to my balance sheet? What does that do to my borrowing capacity? And then what am I doing with respect to working capital? Uh, but from a long-term perspective, you know, I, the, the question we get a lot is uh, along the lines of, you know, should I, should I buy a farm at these kind of prices? Uh, 
And I'm not going to tell anybody that they need to go head to head with somebody at an auction that, you know, two of you have been wanting to buy the same farm for the last 50 years and you, and you basically keep raising your hands and we hear about some of those prices. Those don't sound attractive to me. But if you think about your long run growth strategy, if you've got enough retained earnings, um, what we would like to see people and, and encourage some people to do, and we've worked with some farms that do this, is to think about reinvesting those retained earnings on an annual basis uh, to help that farm grow over time, which is a dollar cost averaging strategy. In yes. other words, not worrying so much about what farmland values are today, uh, next year, or the year after, but recognize that from a long-term perspective, farmland values tend to rise over time, much like stock values tend to rise You've over time. You've got to hold. I mean, that's why you're going to keep the day traders out of farmland. You've got to, you've got to hold the asset for a long period of time because, as we, as we, as we know, uh, for a five-, six-year period, it can come down, uh, and, but it, it, it tends to correct itself. Uh, if you look at the long-run average land price in West Central Indiana, where we're, where we're at in Tippecanoe County, West, La West Lafayette, Indiana, the average increase since 1960 is 6%. That's a pretty good increase, and you tack, tack on top of that the capitalization rate or the amount of money you get from cash rent. That's a pretty good return. Uh, does that mean it's necessarily going to be that the next 50 years? Who knows? Uh, but we do know that historically it's been a pretty good return. A related question here I sometimes get, and you probably get this too, Jim, is this a good time for, for Junior, uh, to, to Jane or Joe, to come back to the farm? There is no perfect time for anybody to come back to the farm. It's you have to answer two questions. Uh, is this really what you want to do? Uh, we all know that if we're excited about it and we're passionate about something, we're going to do a better job. So is this really what I want to do? Uh, and, and, and the second question is, is it possible, do we have the wherewithal to expand the operation if the operation is not big enough uh, for two or more generations? All right. So we said we were going to answer some questions. I, unfortunately, I think we've kind of gone slightly over our time. However, uh, we will be around uh, after this session, and I will be here uh, over the next two days at our booth. Our booth is 2130 on the floor, and I'll be hanging around the booth most of today and most of tomorrow and would love to visit with you individually at, at that point. So thanks so much for thanks coming. Thanks for coming.